Welcome to SVG TV News for Monday, February 26, 2024. I am Rochelle Matisse with the details. In four days, St. Vincent and the Grenadines will host the eighth summit of CELAC at the Sanders Resort at Bookermand. The event, which has been deemed as the largest diplomatic gathering in the history of SVG, is seen as a significant milestone for the country, showcasing its commitment to diplomacy, collaboration and global leadership. SVG's ambassador to the Republic of Cuba, His Excellency Ellsworth John, on NBC Radio face-to-face -face program virtually today, said he is satisfied with the readiness of SVG to host the CELAC summit despite minor hiccups of accommodation. Ambassador John says the CELAC summit provides an opportunity for all 33 member states to speak to what they see as the current priorities for the grouping to be engaged. I am sure that the, the, at, the, at the final count, we probably have over 300 persons who would come to St. Vincent for this meeting. We have large contingents of security and media persons mm -hmm. that are coming for the meeting in addition to the delegations. So that has been our biggest challenge, but I think we are, we are working to overcome those things and we, we should be in good shape um, on Friday. So every 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 head of delegation would, would speak at the, the at the summit. The we will also have uh, an interaction with our special invited guests, and I could mention one: the Secretary General of the United Nations is going to be in attendance with a fairly big big delegation, mm -hmm. and. We will have representatives from a, a number of the countries that I, I mentioned before who we are partnering with from the EU, from China, from India. Um, we will also have representatives from them that they will be interfacing with. The Secretary General and the Prime Minister, of course, would speak at the opening and we'll also have a report on, on the work that we have done as a PTP. On what can be expected from the CELAC Summit, Ambassador John says, since, since St. Vincent and the Grenadines assumed the pro-temporio presidency, they've been concentrating on a number of areas of priority, such as developing a CELAC plan for food security and agriculture. While I have mentioned the main persons in the PTP, we have also been supported by the various ministries here in, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And there have been persons dedicated in some of these ministries to working on, for example, the, the outcome document on the food and security plan. We, we, we have persons from the Ministry of Agriculture and the, the, the Minister of Agriculture has been very engaged in that. We also have, um, we have had at least two meetings that were chaired by the Minister of Finance one was held in Chile, one was held in, uh, I can't remember which European country, I think it was Spain, um, to look at the whole question of financing, look at the uh, financial architecture. For the Caribbean, the whole issue of looking at the change in the financial architecture under which we operate has been very important. And thanks to an initiative by, the, by Barbados called the Bridgetown Initiative, we have been able to use that initiative to focus attention on changes that we see as important in terms of how the Washington consensus, for example, um, World Bank, IMF, how they do business. Mm -hmm. And while there might be some differences of opinion in terms of what elements of the Bridgetown um, initiative can be used, the fact that we have it as a base document to work with has allowed us to push this to the forefront um, as an agenda item for us during this year. Ambassador John says the presidency for CELAC changes over the years. A few issues have consistently been emphasized as crucial for CELAC's involvement, one of which is how it can offer citizens economic benefits, which he said they are working on to address collectively. He pointed out a few benefits of holding the presidency of CELAC. And then there are issues related to culture because part of if, if when, when you look at some of the issues that we've been discussing. We are discussing how, how we can um, speak more clearly on the our heritage as a region, how we can claim back 
um, what is our history and working collectively as a, a, a Latin America and, and Caribbean community to do that is, is, is something that I think we have highlighted um, during this period. And the fact that we have placed such an emphasis on, on our engagement in Africa also meant that we have advanced in terms of looking at issues affecting Afro-Caribbean descendants, Afro-descendants um, during this year. And a lot of focus in our discussions over the last three months have, have been on issues related to Afro-Caribbean descendants. We know that in Brazil, for example, there's over 100 million persons of Afro-Caribbean, of African descent. And while we, of course, are familiar with the, the fact that there are so many persons of African descent from Brazil that plays football, um, we felt it was, and Brazil in particular felt it was important that we, 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 took, we took a close look at that issue. And we have a, a working group that has been operationalized during our presidency to deal with that particular issue. Representatives from over 33 countries are expected to come together here in SVG for the 8th CELAC Summit when Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez will hand over leadership of the pro tempore presidency uh, to the president of Honduras. A welcome reception will kickstart the summit on Thursday, February 29, 2024. The opening ceremony will be held on Friday, March 1st, with a news conference to be followed in the afternoon. All schools across St. Vincent and the Grenadines will be closed on Thursday and Friday to accommodate the hosting of the historic event. And the Civil Aviation Department today announces the establishment of a prohibited airspace, the TVP-1, within a radius of two nautical miles around the Sandals Resort, where the CELAC Summit will be held. The department says the measure is implemented to ensure the safety and security of the summit attendees and the general public. The prohibited airspace where the use of drones Unmanned aerial vehicle is prohibited, spans from Camden Park in the south to Montwin to the north, Duba to the east, and extends two nautical miles to the west. The Civil Aviation Department says this no drone zone will be in effect from February 28 to March 2, 2024. Drone operators are advised to refrain from flying within the designated area during this specified period. The Civil Aviation Department is also also reminding the public that operating drones within St. Vincent and the Grenadines requires a permit and that drones should not be flown near airports, including within the approach and departure parts of aircraft. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez is among regional head heads attending the 46th regular meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community, CARICOM, in Georgetown, Guyana. On his arrival in Guyana on Sunday, Prime Minister Gonzalez was greeted by Guyana's Minister of Natural Resources, Vikram Bharat, and other government officials. Among the items on the agenda for the 40 meeting are climate change and climate financing, report from the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparations, status of the Caribbean Court of Justice Trust Fund, developments in the Middle East, Israel's continued bombing of Gaza, and the fourth international conference on small island development as states to be held in Antigua and Barbuda in May. Earlier today, on the sidelines of the CARICOM Heads meeting, Prime Minister Gonzalez met with a special envoy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the UAE. The Prime Minister is expected back home just before the start of the much-anticipated CELAC Summit, which opens here on Thursday, February 29th. And leader of the opposition New Democratic Party, Dr. Godwin Friday, and Senator Chevron John attended the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, the WFD Cross Party Women Lead Conference in London from the 20th to the 21st of February 2024. The conference is said to have brought together various political parties, leaders, and activists from across the United Kingdom and the world on the important issue of women's political participation. A news release says the aim of the conference conference was to shine a light on political party practices that identify and nurture women candidates and support them in their journey in political representation and leadership. Political party representatives from around the world showcased and learned about reforms and 
innovations that political parties can adopt to better support women candidates. Nick Francis, Secretary General of the CDU, who also attended the conference, noted that political parties are the main vehicle through which people representation is achieved. Therefore, it is critical to continue engagement with their member parties in the Caribbean to ensure greater inclusion of women and youth in the decision-making process at both the party and parliamentary levels. He also expressed gratitude to the Conservatives' WFD program for providing the sponsorship support for the conference. The news release says the NDP leader praised the WFD and representatives from across the political party spectrum for organizing the important initiative and thanked fellow attendees for robust conversations on the way forward towards supporting women in the political space. Senator John noted that she was truly inspired and encouraged by the experiences shared by other female parliamentarians, which reinforced her resolve to continue fighting for gender equality here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The release says the WFD Women-Led Cross-Party Conference ended with pledges to introduce reforms to further support women's political participation and leadership within political parties. In other local news now, we hear that the presidents of the SVG Teachers Union and the Public Service Union are refuting claims that there was a misappropriation of funds raised from a radioton held in 2022 to assist teachers and other public servants who were affected by the government's vaccine mandate. The matter was addressed at a news conference today after the issue was raised on a radio program on Sunday, just two days shy of the SVG TU elections, scheduled to be held tomorrow, Tuesday, February 27th and Wednesday, February 28th, 2024. It is alleged that the monies raised through the Radiaton $20,000 were never distributed to the teachers and the other affected public servants. However, today's news conference, the SVG TU incumbent president Oswald Robinson uh, said that given that they are in the election mode, he expects things to be said sometimes out of proportion. However, it is their responsibility as a union to maintain the public image of the union while noting that all of the monies pledged through the Radiaton was never received. Making reference to an article on the subject matter, uh, Robinson said, given the amount collected from the Radiaton uh, pledge, the executive of the SVG to you made a decision not to disperse the money to the affected teachers until at a later time. If what is being quoted in the, in the papers is correct, if it is $1,800 received mm -hmm. and we had 212 teachers dismissed, you do the maths. Each teacher would get approximately $8.49. Mm -hmm. So the executive decide, it doesn't make any sense to give that. Leave somebody from North Wind or North Leeward, the Grenadines, and come up on the mainland to get $8.49. Okay? So it was the executive that made that decision to put that money aside until we are able to attract other funds to, um, to give to our teachers. It must be known that the St. Vincent Grand Teachers Union has been coming to the assistance and supporting the teachers who are dismissed in many, many ways because we took a holistic approach in which we provide support. We provided monetary support to our teachers. We gave each teacher $250. It amounts us to about $53,000. You understand? That was very early o'clock. Mm -hmm. I think it was in coming close to December mm -hmm. when the mandate was imposed. And then all in the year, somewhere around February, March, somewhere around there, we rolled out another, another portion of money to the dismissed teachers. Right? And every teacher who was dismissed came to our attention, they, they, they got support. We must also bear in mind that the teachers union paid 40,000, about 500 yeah. for legal fees for the dismissed teachers. The matter was in court. Recently, we have just paid another $40,000. Robinson further noted that during the period teachers were off the job due to the government's vaccine mandate, a good Samaritan came to the assistance and provided them with food packages, which were distributed to the affected teachers. He said other assistance were offered to the teachers, including support to their children who were successful at the CPA exams by way of scholarships or bursaries. We also went further than that. 
and we had psychosocial skills. We had online presentation by the CUT, the Caribbean Union of Teachers, by CTF, by our own local persons here. I remember Dr. Joseph Miller sat on one of those programs and we empower our teachers. We also provide training in alternative employment opportunities. We took a holistic approach. We had sessions of prayers several times. We look at the spiritual part of the teachers because they needed support, they needed help. And we went all throughout to, to assist our, our, our members. And we have given a commitment that we will continue. So it's a little unfortunate that something could be put in the media to say, you know, like an accountability or lack of transparency. That is not, that's not what happened. Every single cent that has been in the union's accounts, they are, they are audited. We have our financial auditor. We have external auditors who audited the union statements. And even now, as we are going into the, the Biennium Convention, which will be held in April, the auditor has already been contracted to audit the accounts to go into. In fact, we would lodge with the register our financial statements. So the records are there to show. Thanking the opposition New Democratic Party for standing in solidarity with the unions and for offering assistance to help raise funds for the affected public servants through the Radioton, Boucher said while $20,000 were pledged, only half of the amount was collected and that the PSU received its share of that amount, which is distributed to affected members. That the Public Service Union received $4,022 from that amount. The teachers' union received the same amount, $4,022, and the Police Welfare Association received $2,000. Um, we, in the Public Service Union, would have taken the initiative to distribute what we received based on assessment that we would have done looking at who, who, among all of the dismissed public servants, who were the most vulnerable. And based on that, that money was distributed to those persons who, based on our findings, were suffering the most of all of the other workers. Um, so the insinuation, and it's, it's really an unfortunate situation that a member of the executive, of course, of the teachers' union, who, do, who seem not to have the information, would make statements that can implicate other unions and even organizations at a time when the great concern, the focus, was on people who are suffering. To use this particular matter for personal gain, to advance your chances, I, I suppose that is the whole reason, to advance your chances of being elected to lead um, the, um, the, the teachers' union. It's unfortunate that such tactics really would have been used. Boucher said that the SVG Teachers Union, the Public Service Union, and the Police Welfare Association have a good working relationship. And it's it, through that spirit of solidarity that allowed them to get issues affected public sector workers addressed. Now some news on the weather. In its 72 hours outlook, the SVG Met Services says fair to partly cloudy conditions will persist across St. Vincent and Grenadines within the next 24 hours, with models suggesting that a favorable upper level could provide support to unstable conditions on Wednesday, increasing the possibility of showers. In addition, it sells a lay of Sahara 
Ontarian air mass will also continue to reduce visibility and air quality within the next 48 hours. Residents and small craft operators are asked to continue to exercise caution for reduced visibility and air quality due to Saharan dust haze. Moderate to fresh easterly to east-northeasterly trades are expected to continue to cross the islands. A slight decrease in wind speed is expected on Wednesday. Seas are expected to remain slight to moderate in open waters with swells ranging between 1.0 meters to 2.0 meters. <laughs> Now we hear that a joint regional investigation between the Royal St. Vincent and the Grandines Police Force and the Royal Grenada Police Force is ongoing into the disappearance and presumed death of two United States citizens, namely Ralph Henshry and his common-law wife, Cathy Brandel. In a statement this afternoon on the joint regional investigation, head of the RSVG Police Force Public Relations and Complaints Department, Superintendent Junior Simmons, says the main suspects in the investigations are three male prisoners who escaped lawful custody on Sunday, February 18, 2024, while being held at the South St. George Police Station in Grenada on charges of rape, robbery with violence, and other serious offenses. The names of the suspect escapees are Ron Mitchell, 30 years, Trevon Robinson, 25 years, and Atiba Stancellas, 23 years, all of Paradise St. Andrew, Grenada. SOP Simmons says the investigation thus far indicates that after the escapees suspects escaped, they hijacked a yacht named Simplicity that was moored at Granans Beach in Grenada and kidnapped the couple. The investigation further reveals that while sailing from Grenada, the suspects committed several criminal acts, including bodily harm to the couple. On Monday, 19 February 2024, the escapees suspects illegally entered the southwestern coast of St. Vincent and Grandines sometime in the afternoon and docked the act of Wallilobo Anchorage. On Wednesday, 21st February 2024, the police received certain information concerning the escapees and the discovery of a yacht in the said area. A manhunt was immediately launched and the SVD Coast Guard and the crime scene unit were dispatched to the location where the yacht was found. The scene was processed and found to be consistent with signs of violence. Several items were strewn on the deck and in the cabin and a red substance that resembled blood was seen on board. There was no discovery of bodies on board the yacht. About 4.35 p.m. later the said day, the three suspects, escapees, were apprehended by the police in the village of Petty Bordel on the northwestern coast of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Grenadine authorities were subsequently informed about the escapees' arrest, and the team of investigators from the Royal Grenada Police Force arrived in St. Vincent and the Grenadines on a Thursday 22nd February 2024 and are assisting with the investigations. SOP Simmons says the SKP suspects are cooperating with the investigation and that the regional security system and the Grenadian and Vincentian Coast Guards are conducting air and maritime patrols and surveillance across the borders of both islands but nobodies have been recovered. Based on the investigation thus far, it is presumed that Ralph Hendry and Kathy Brandel are uh, deceased. The Acting Commissioner of Police in charge of crimes, Mr. Trevor Bailey, met with family members of the couple and the legal representative and updated them on the status of the investigation. The RSUDPF sympathizes with the family during this time of difficulty. All day today, Monday, 26 February 2024, the three suspects, escapees, appeared at the Kingston Marshall Court on four counts each of immigration related charges, which include A. Enter the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines other than at a port of entry. B. Enter the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines by boat 
and disembarked without the consent of an immigration officer. C. Entered the state of St. Vincent and the Grenadines and knowingly and willfully allowed themselves to land as prohibited immigrants. And D. Being a prohibited immigrant, entered the state by boat without a passport. They pleaded guilty to the charges. They were remanded in custody for sentencing, which is scheduled for Monday, 4th March, 2024. The investigation and search for the missing persons continue. The investigation further reveals that while sailing from Grenada, the suspects committed several criminal acts, including bodily harm to the couple. And the police here have charged 22-year-old Jeremiah Samuel of Rose Hall with kidnapping and murder of a one-year-old infant of the same address. The charges were laid against the accused on Sunday, February 25, 2024, at the Major Crime Unit at the police headquarters in Kingstown. Samuel is charged that on Saturday, February 10, 2024, in Rose Hall, he stole and carried away the infant without the consent of a mother. With malice of her thought, caused the death of the infant by an unlawful act. The defendant appeared before the King's Magistrate Court today and was not allowed to plead to the indictable charge. He was remanded into custody until June 25th when the preliminary inquiry is expected to commence. In other local news now, we hear that the Girls' Guides Association of St. Vincent and the Grenadines celebrated World Thinking Day on Friday, February 22, 2024, under the theme, Our World, Our Thriving Future. To mark the occasion, hundreds of ranger guides, girl guides, bim-bims, and young leaders assembled at the grammar school playing field with signs of the team and then marched on to the Girls' Guides headquarters at Level Gardens where a rally was held. At the rally, girl guiding alumni, Nafisia Richardson, and encourage the guides to always look out and care for the environment. The word our comes up twice in the theme. What does our mean? Our is a collective word. It refers to something that belongs to all of us. And we're all connected when we use the word our. So if we want to break it down in Vinci terms, we can say that the theme is we world and we thrive in future because it is all of ours. Or are we world, as I'm being told it about, are we world and are we future? What does the world mean? The earth and all the people and the things within it. The world is comprised of 71% oceans, 29% land. And all of the living things in the world make up our biodiversity. And so if we're thinking about a thriving world, we have to do everything that we can to keep this biodiversity alive. And our future, what does our future mean? Our future does not refer to today, but it refers to tomorrow, to all of the time that is to come. So it means that we're thinking about not just ourselves, but our little sisters, our little brothers, the children that we may have, and future generations. During the celebration event, five guides were awarded with the Chief Commissioner's Award for the Outstanding Service to the Community, attaining international leadership experience and committing to their guiding badges and projects. The five are Afia Clubs of No. 28 Kingston Girl Guides Company, Ariana Roberts of No. 1 Kingston Girl Guides Company, Davina Jackson of No. 16 Kingston Girl Guide Company, Halia Williams Douglas of No. 1 Kingston Girl Guides Company, Kevisha Richardson of number 28 Kingston Girls Guide Company. Chief Commissioner of the Girls Guide Association, SVG Laura Brown, encouraged the guides to maintain only excellent standards and do their best at all times. The Girls Guides Association also hosted the annual Altia Kamishang Brownlee Public Speaking competition as part of the World Thinking Day celebrations. The topic for the prepared speech was climate change has been linked to global poverty. If this is true, what can be done to ensure a better future for all of us? The public speaking competition was won by Naomi Fraser of the Sugar Mill Bim Bims and Brownlee Pack. Second place went to Briani Pompey of the number 30 Kingston Open Brownlee Pack. And third place, Giovanni Hamlet of the number 22 St. Mary's Roman Catholic Brownlee's Pack, who won the impromptu speech category.